This week, the Trump administration announced that the U.S. would no longer consider Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank a violation of international law, reversing four decades of U.S. government policy. While the Israeli government praised the decision, most countries and the United Nations continue to view settlements as illegal. But when it comes to Israel and the occupied territories, including Gaza, does international law even matter anymore? Or is it just whatever the United States says it is? Joining me to debate this from Ramallah, Omar Shakir, the Director of Human Rights Watch in Israel and Palestine, and here in the studio, Professor Eugene Kontorovich, an international law professor at the George Mason University Scalia Law School and the Israeli think tank, the Kohelet Policy Forum. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. Um, Omar, let me start with you. Does this latest US decision to disregard international law and recognize Israeli settlements in the occupied territories make those settlements any less illegal? Will it change the way the rest of the world sees those settlements? The US declaration changes nothing. The Trump administration cannot erase decades of established international law that settlements are a violation of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention and, in fact, a war crime. And I think this, the range of statements that you referenced from the European Union, from many countries across the world, from the UN, indicate that there is consensus outside of the, this Israeli government and outside of the Trump administration that settlements are illegal. It is as uncontroversial to say settlements are illegal as it is to say that torture is illegal. It is black and white international law. Eugene, do you want to respond to that? It's black and white. It's uncontroversial. Yeah, it's completely wrong. It hasn't even been the policy of the United States since the Reagan administration. Uh, and it's not the policy of the international community. And it's not the policy of Human Rights Watch. And you see that there are Armenian settlers in Nagorno-Karabakh. There's now Turkey is moving millions of people into northern Syria. Morocco me moves people into western Sahara. And in none of these cases has Human Rights Watch or the international community said this violates Article 49.6 of the Geneva Convention. That's not international law. This is a special standard that's been invented to prevent Jews from living in Judea and Samaria. That's absolutely incorrect. Human Rights Watch covers 100 countries across the world. You can look up our reports on Western Sahara, for example. You can look up our reports on Crimea, the same law of occupation that has been in the international system for nearly, you know, for over 70 years is the exact same system that we use here. It's Article 49 of the, Gen of the Geneva Convention. The reality here is Israel doesn't want to play by the same set of rules. Those settlements are built on land stolen from Palestinians that are from there, and settlements are at the core of a two-tiered discriminatory regime that treats Palestinians separately and unequally. And the reality is here the war crime is not the, 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 the uh, settler himself is not a war criminal. The war crime is the act of transfer of a population okay. to territory acquired by war. Eugene, let me just pick up on a substantive issue yeah. you mentioned and Omar mentioned, um, you know, the application to other areas of the world. Uh, Crimea was mentioned. Yes. Uh, Russia has been sanctioned for its invasion and annexation of Crimea. Just last month, the UN Assistant Secretary General went to the General Assembly and said that on the issue of the occupation, he said, it is against the Geneva Conventions for Russia to transfer its population into an occupied area. You say only Israel is being held to that standard. Not true. Uh, Russia invaded Crimea and seized this in a military conflict where it was the aggressor. Israel, I must submit, did not take this from another country that owned it. This was not Jordanian with, territory. I understand the argument. Yes. With respect, you're slightly moving the goalposts. You said that no one applies this standard of the Fourth Geneva Convention of moving populations. I'm saying they are applying it in Crimea. Do you recognize it? It has been mentioned by a couple UN reports. The in UN Assistant to, Secretary General yeah, for Human in, Rights in, said it last month. In relation to Crimea, they have not been sanctioned for this. They've been sanctioned for the invasion. It's not been applied to Nagorno-Karabakh, Western Cyprus, Western... Uh, but Sahara, it has been applied to North, Crimea. Northern, uh, they have mentioned it in regard to Crimea. So the UN has talked about it in the context of Crimea. It's not Israel is not a special case here. There is one other case that does not make. Okay, it's a pretty big one. And, and just on the subject of uh, uh, this idea of stolen Palestinian land, do you want to respond to that point? The idea of that this is, a, we haven't used the O word yet. Yeah. The whole point about settlements flows from the idea that this is an occupation. What's your response to that? Uh, you can only occupy the territory of another country. That's what Russia did. It invaded what everyone regarded was Ukrainian territory. In 1967, when Israel retook the West Bank, it was not Jordanian territory. Jordan was not the sovereign. It was not, there was no Palestinian state. It's not occupation. As for the idea that all of this land belongs to private Palestinians, it's ridiculous. That's because international organizations refuse to recognize the validity of sales 
to private Jews. Jews buy land, own land from the 1920s. Would Omar agree that Jews could live in land that has been in private Jewish property since the 1920s? Or does he say there is no such thing as private Jewish property in the West Bank? Omar, do you want to respond to that? Absolutely. Look, Eugene is trying to muck up what is black and white. Eugene is right. There is some land that were owned privately by Jewish families before 1967. But the reality here is Eugene is trying to make complicated what is not. Every country virtually in the world recognizes the uh, West Bank and East Jerusalem. By the way, even this U.S. government to this point, um, can, but every other country in the world considers it to be occupied territory. This is not some matter that needs to, you know, an international law professor to tell you how to read lines in the but Fourth oh, Geneva Convention. But it's Omar, black let me, and white. Omar, let me bring you. Hold, hold on, you say it's black and white, but there is a gray area in the case of the in the West Bank because uh, Eugene makes the point, and a lot of people defending Israel's behavior in that part of the world do make this argument that the, there was no sovereign power there when the Israelis took it over in 1967. It wasn't, it's not as clear cut as Crimea being part of Ukraine and formal Ukrainian borders. Is that fair right. or no? The exact, same, the exact same United Nations mechanism that set out the creation of Israel set out the creation of a separate political entity that would be a Palestinian state uh, that was supposed to be on 45 percent of the land. And of course, we know what happened as a result of the conflict. But the reality is the same international legal apparatus that led to the creation of the state of Israel is the same bodies that have not only set out the creation of a separate entity, but also have continuously reaffirmed, including at the Security Council in 2016 and 2234, the illegality of settlements as a matter of consensus international law. Okay, let me bring Eugene to respond to that. Yeah, so uh, international law, any system of law, you work, it works by figuring out what the rule is by looking at how it's applied otherwise. If I'm a lawyer in a yeah. case, I'm going to cite nine other okay. cases to see what the Fine. law is. You made that you point. And we've talked about the other examples. You've said there are examples that don't and count. And that's how you figure out what I the rule is. I pointed out examples. Just on the occupation thing, you, you don't believe there's an occupation. For sure, for two reasons. By, under the terms of the State Department's own memo, yeah. the State Department con concluded that while the territory wasn't Jordan's, it was Jordan's enough to trigger the law okay. of occupation. But, why do said, we... but if there's a peace treaty with Jordan, then there'll be no okay. occupation. There's but why do we need the State Department or Mike Pompeo or Donald Trump's legal expertise when we have the Israeli Supreme Court saying in 2005 the Judea and Samaria areas are held by the State of Israel in belligerent occupation? The military command in the area is not the sovereign in the territory held in belligerent occupation. The Israeli Supreme Court says it's a belligerent occupation. Yeah, so it's a common misstatement to say that the Israeli Supreme Court has adopted this position. Uh, I didn't say the, that. I said the Israeli yes. Supreme Court said it's a belligerent occupation. That's correct. So th that is not exactly accurate, but it's not accurate at all, because what the Israeli, what the Israeli government has done, uh, and it's a little complicated legally, yeah. is they have voluntarily said we're going to apply part of the law of belligerent occupation to the territories as a matter of discretion, just like uh, the Bush administration applied parts of the Geneva Con Convention to Guantanamo or saying it doesn't apply. So when the Israeli Supreme Court says they're applying the framework of uh, occupation, they mean as an administrative matter because... And when, and when Ariel Sharon, who wasn't exactly yeah. a friend of the Palestinians, when he said, you may not like the word, but what's happening is occupation. Holding 3.5 million Palestinians under occupation is a bad thing for Israel. What, Should we trust him or Mike Pompeo? What's great is that Israel is a democracy. And it's irrelevant to what no, I just no, said. No, I'll, I'll explain. In their, people express many different political people, views. The Prime Minister yeah. of Israel, perhaps politicians, Israel's most famous... Politicians express many different views, unlike with the Palestinians, okay. where there's only one view. Okay. And I would say you can trust views that come so, out of us. So, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I just need to finish. Omar, 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 I'll let you come back in. I just need to deal with this. Ariel Sharon, the yeah. former Prime Minister of Israel, perhaps Israel's most famous lawyer. politician. But he was the prime minister of the but government, which, which so, you said applied. So if you trust Israeli prime ministers, yeah. Prime Minister it's Netanyahu about, says there is no occupation. Okay, and I'm so asking, if you're holding by Matthew, Israeli prime ministers... I'm just wondering why lost. Sharon said that. We're getting, because he was trying to achieve lost. a political goal. Lost lost a little bit. justifying the withdrawal in Gaza. We're, we're getting lost a little bit here in the word occupation. Look at what Eugene's trying to tell you. On one hand, it's telling you it's not an occupation. Yeah. Okay, let's say Eugene's right. Let's buy, but let's say we throw out everything, uh, you know, the consensus opinion in the world. That means that Israel rules over millions of Palestinians that have no ability to vote, so have no political rights. They cannot move freely, while Israeli Jews who live in the exact same territory are citizens of the state with full free movement, with full political rights, okay. with full civil rights, with full access to water and electricity. Eugene wants his cake and eats it too. He wants to call Israel democracy, but then say that it is there's no occupation, so Israel's a sovereign, meaning okay. there are rules oh, over my. millions of Palestinians. You made the point. No Let Eugene come back. You're having uh, your cake and eat it. It's not occupation, but you don't give these people any rights. Omar wants to have his cake and eat it too, because in the Golan in eastern Jerusalem, 
where the residents can vote, where everyone can vote and is eligible for citizenship. There, he doesn't feel that's any better, where Israel said, okay, you, everyone here can become a citizen. We're formally applying Israeli law in full. There, the international community and Human Rights Watch say that's even worse if you give them a right to vote. Omar, Eugene, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you both for joining me in the Cheers. arena. That's our show. Up front, we'll be back next week.